Let's turn to the Word of God this morning. Turn in the Old Testament to Amos chapter 2. The prophet Amos chapter 2. We'll read verses 4 to 16. Then we'll turn to Mark chapter 14 for the reading and preaching of the Word this morning. Amos chapter 2. Amos was a, a shepherd, shepherd of Tekoa, who prophesied, spoke of God's judgment against Judah, against Israel, and against the nations around them. And he had this way, if you read Amos 1 and 2, you see how he, he would, you'll hear how he, he speaks of, uh, of the, the Lord's judgment in terms of the number of transgressions, the, the pattern for three transgressions and for four. And we see this even in this passage here. Amos chapter 2, beginning at verse 4. Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Judah and for four, I will not turn away its punishment, because they have despised the law of the Lord and have not kept his commandments. Their lies lead them astray, lies which their fathers followed. But I will send a fire upon Judah, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel, and for four, I will not turn away its punishment, because they sell the righteous for silver, and the poor for a pair of sandals. They pant after the dust of the earth, which is on the head of the poor, and pervert the way of the humble. A man and his father go in to the same girl, to defile my holy name. They lie down by every altar, on clothes taken in pledge, and drink the wine of the condemned in the house of their God. Yet it was I who destroyed the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars, and he was as strong as the oaks. Yet I destroyed his fruit above and his roots beneath. Also it was I who brought you up from the land of Egypt and led you forty years through the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. I raised up some of your sons as prophets, and some of your young men as Nazarites. Is it not so, O you children of Israel, says the Lord? But you gave the Nazarites wine to drink, and commanded the prophets, saying, Do not prophesy. Behold, I am weighed down by you, as a cart full of sheaves is weighed down. Therefore, flight shall perish from the swift. The strong shall not strengthen his power, nor shall the mighty deliver himself. He shall not stand who handles the bow. The swift of foot shall not escape, nor shall he who rides a horse deliver himself. The most courageous men of might shall flee naked in that day, says the Lord. I'll turn to Mark chapter 14. But we'll read again verses 27 to 52. We'll consider the last part of this reading this morning. Then Jesus said to his disciples, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even if all are made to stumble, yet I will not be. Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you that today, even this night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he spoke more vehemently, If I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said likewise. And they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John with him, and he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch. He went a little further and fell, and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Then he came and found them sleeping, and said to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. 
The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed and spoke the same words. When he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. Then he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now his betrayer had given them a signal, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him and lead him away with lead him away safely. And as soon as he had come, immediately he went up to him and said to him, Rabbi, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then they laid their hands on him and took him. And one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I was daily with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then they all forsook him and fled. Now a certain young man followed him, having a linen cloth thrown around his naked body. And the young man laid hold of him, and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. In the early church, there was a church father named Athanasius. He lived in the 300s. And he was a key figure in the, in the debate in the church at the time over the Trinity, over the, uh, the, the persons of the debate over the persons of, of the Son and the Holy Spirit in the Trinity. The language, uh, this was the time when the language that we have and that we recite in the Nicene Creed was formed speaking of the Son and the Holy Spirit as God equal with the Father. We can take that for granted because we recite these truths and, and, uh, and, and we know that, that, that across, uh, the, the, across Christendom, even in its broadest form, including Eastern Orthodox or, or Roman Catholics, and Protestants, all Protestants, that we would recite that creed and agree with what it states about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But this was not always the case, and, and in the 300s, there was a raging debate. There were those who, who, were, who denied that Jesus would have been God equal with the Father, and that the Spirit was God equal with the Father. They would say that, for example, particularly about Jesus, that, uh, that Jesus was of a similar substance to the Father and was very close but he was still a created being. He was the highest of all creatures, but still created. He was not of the same substance as the Father. But those like Athanasius who would, would, were arguing and saying, no, Scripture very clearly teaches that, that Jesus Christ and the Spirit are God equal with the Father. They're not of a different substance. They're of the same substance. And so they fought, on the, they, they fought for this truth against others against those who, who we call Arians, those who deny the, the, uh, the equality between uh, among the members of the Trinity. Athanasius fought against the tide. For across the, 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 the church at the time, and, and in the Roman Empire, where the emperor was, was, uh, had great sway over what the church believed, there was an overwhelming majority that were Arian, that were against what Athanasius was teaching. An overwhelming, uh, it, it was as if the whole world st uh, was in error and Athanasius stood alone, again, it stood alone for the truth of the Word of God. That's how Athanasius was, began to be called Athanasius Contramundum, Athanasius against the world, where he stood against the tide of false teaching, against 
an in, incorrect view of Scripture. And what we take for granted today, God used, God, God established that truth that we take for granted today using men like Athanasius who stood alone in that important debate over the Trinity. He trusted the very triune God he, he loved and, and desired to have worshipped in truth. And he followed in the footsteps not just, uh, not just as an example of one of the great men, not just following the footsteps of the great men of history who stood alone against error, but he followed in the footsteps of Jesus Christ, his Savior. The one who stood alone in order to carry out the work God had called him to do and to, in order to establish his church and to establish it in truth. He's in one example falls and flows from the great example of Jesus Christ who stood alone and went all the way to the cross and through his work alone. Because Jesus Christ stood alone in that hour, every one of his people is able, by his grace, to stand alone as well, to stand for him, to stand true to him. You and I are unable to stand for Jesus Christ even if everyone else was against was against us because Jesus Christ himself stood alone and overcame overcame all things to earn our salvation and to give us the power to stand as he stood to live for him even if that means living for him alone Christ set the example for us and he enables us by his spirit to run the race that he ran and to do so alone if we must to do the father's will even if no one else will. This morning we're going to see the Savior facing the cross, the hours leading up to his death, and he does it alone. We're going to learn, and we're going to learn how, how, we, how, how we must look to him and seek his grace to stand alone for him and with him, even if abandoned by everyone else. And it's a reminder that, that our salvation comes because Christ stood alone. And so we must stand alone for him if he calls us to that. We're going to see from these verses in Mark 14, is that arrested by Jesus and abandoned by the rest, your Lord willingly approached the cross all alone. Arrested by Judas and abandoned by the, by the rest, your Lord willingly approached the cross all alone. We're going to see in verses 43 to 49, we're going to see him abandoned. Or so we're going to see him arrested. And then in verses 50 to 52, we're going to see him abandoned. Arrested and abandoned. First, we see Jesus arrested. And he was arrested by something of an army. We see in verse 43, immediately while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Last week, we encountered Jesus in Gethsemane as he was wrestling with his, with his father in prayer. He was wrestling against temptation, striving to bring his human will into line with his divine will. To go willingly to the cross, to suffer the wrath of God against sin on behalf of sinners to bring salvation for his people. We saw him fight and win against that temptation. And yet, we also saw how his disciples didn't, weren't, weren't successful, weren't even really fighting against temptation, but were sleeping. And Jesus would come back to them and he'd tell them, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. But now Jesus had finished his fight. He had come back fully submitted to go to the cross and he woke his disciples up a third time. And he said, get up, let's go. My betrayer is at hand. Let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And even as those very words were in his mouth, his betrayer arrived. And this brings us from where we ended last week to where we're going to begin this week. Judas arrived. His betrayer arrived. Even as the words that Jesus was saying were in his mouth, this happened. The Israelites of Prophecy spoken and fulfilled before it was fully spoken. His disciples should have taken notice of this. His disciples should have realized this was all happening according to plan. This wasn't accidental. But they were too concerned about who had arrived and what was going to take place. Judas arrived. 
and Mark is careful to point out, he was one of the twelve. One who, one of the very disciples who had followed Jesus, had such gospel privileges, had such access to the Savior himself, and yet rejected him, turned from him, hardened his heart, and now was coming with an army to betray him. He comes with this great multitude with swords and clubs, and, and John will tell us as well, there were some from the from some Roman soldiers there as well. It was, I call it an army, but it was kind of a bit of a haphazard army, and maybe more of a mob. It was it was always hastily a hastily assembled crowd to come and to take Jesus. Some of the perhaps the temple police and some of the the Roman soldiers, and there were even some religious some of the religious leaders were were there as well as Luke tells us in Luke twenty two. It's a bit of an absurd scene. I mean, we're in we're in a remote place. We're in the middle of the night, and there's twelve. Eleven disciples and Jesus. And here comes this army to take Jesus. It was absurd. If they didn't think Jesus was God and he didn't have power, then they, why would they come with so many people? Uh, it seemed that they, they, the army was way too much for what they needed. But of course it's also absurd because Jesus is God. And if, if Jesus wanted to fight back, then no, no number of men, no, how, no matter how big the army would, would have been, they were no match for him. But this crowd comes to take Jesus. Really, what it demonstrates is it shows the rage of the religious leaders against Jesus. The violent way in which they are coming to take him shows that their violent rage and hatred against him. They hated him. And they wanted to... They, 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 they were raging against him, pictured in this army that was coming. They, he, he had never... It never threatened them with violence. But his words had cut them deeper than any sword could have. And they raged against him. You know, I think of our brothers and sisters in Christ who face active, violent, brutal persecution today in the world. Why are they, why are they treated so violently? Have you ever thought to yourself, why are Christians treated so violently? Is it because they're threatening violence? Is it because they're, they're threatening insurrection in violent ways? No, it's because their message is intolerable. Because those who hear their words and hear of their need to bow the knee to Jesus Christ won't, don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it and they will go through any means, including violence, to shut the mouths of those who would proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is, although we don't face that violent persecution today, yet we see it encroaching on our own society, where the, the ideas that Scripture promotes, and the words of Scripture are considered intolerant, are considered even violent, are considered to be hateful, and they must be stopped, they must be silenced, they might, we must be quieted. The truth of God is dangerous, and we must not think we will escape the hatred and the rage of sinful men against Christ and His truth. So you and I, as we as we, as we think about those things, we, and we see, we know there's persecution out there, we must be prepare our hearts, seeking the grace of God to not cease to proclaim the truth of God, and to seek His grace that we would have the courage to stand in the face of persecution. We would have the courage to speak, even as Christ spoke, and as His people have spoken, even in the face of violence. When Jesus Christ was arrested, here we see Him arrested by an army. He was arrested with a kiss. Now his betrayer had given them a signal, saying, Whoever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him and lead him away safely. And as soon as he had come, immediately he went up to him and said to him, Rabbi, Rabbi, and kissed him. At the head of this army was the betrayer. At the head of this army was Judas. And he came, he had given them a signal for how they were going to identify Jesus. It was late at night. Perhaps the, the, the lighting wasn't that great. Figured they wouldn't be obvious who Jesus was. And, or perhaps many in the army had barely had, had a passing awareness of who Jesus was anyway. At, at least maybe if they had heard of him, they, many probably hadn't seen him. And so he, he, Judas gives them this signal. Quite a signal. He said, I'll, go, I'll give him a kiss. This, of course, was a, a, a cultural greeting. This was a way of, of showing affection for someone, showing respect to someone. We don't... We don't, uh, we don't, in our own culture here, we don't really, we don't, we don't kiss as a way of greeting. In Europe, you'd find that a whole lot more today than you find that here. But think of it as a, as a, as a good hug or a firm handshake. 
That would identify who Jesus was. It was a disgusting display of fake love and fake affection, for Judas felt none of these things in his heart. He goes up to him and he calls him rabbi, teacher, as if he respected what he had to say and respected his teaching. And then he gives him this kiss. He kisses him affectionately or fervently. They, they, the term actually in verse 45 is different than verse 44. It expresses a fervent or affectionate kiss. One that, that, that at least someone was seeing that from the outside would say he really had, he really respected Jesus. But it was just an act that made his betrayal all that more sinister. And it's revolting, isn't it? Revolting to think of this, that he comes Judas to kiss his Savior, to say, as if, as if to say everything's fine, even though he's about to send him to the cross. But, even as we consider what Judas did here, let's also consider that only a few months prior to this, the very idea, this very idea uh, would have been revolting to Judas as well. Judas did not suddenly wake up one morning and decide he's going to go and he's going to go betray Jesus and do so and all the you know exactly as this as this planned out. His betrayal came from a hardened heart, a heart that was hardened over time as he began to reject them, as he rejected the message of Christ, as he began to steal from the money bag, as he began to engage in well smaller sins, just stealing a little, just just harboring a few sinful thoughts. He hardened himself. He hardened himself until this point where he could callously walk into the garden and greet Jesus, give him a kiss as a signal for the army to take him. Because he hardened his heart through smaller sins, the unthinkable was now not just thinkable, but actually taking place. It's a reminder for you and me to watch or to be careful about sins. There is no such thing as a little sin that is okay to maintain or to harbor, for it grows and grows and grows until it reaches into the unthinkable and actually takes place. As John Owen, the, uh, the English Puritan, famously said, be killing sin, or sin will be killing you. This would have been a shock for the disciples as well. Here was a traitor. This was the traitor. This was the one. Jesus said, one would betray, would betray me, and now they see who, exactly who it is. It's, it's Judas. And perhaps this weakened them. Their resolve, that would have been quite a shock and quite a disturbing, discouraging development. Here's one of our own who's betraying Jesus, and that would have weakened them. And that's true for the church today, too, and we see hypocrites that come out from among us. When we see those who once professed to believe in Jesus, suddenly reveal their true colors and reveal they never knew him at all, and they don't love him, and they, they, it's often a painful thing for the church to go through. The Lord warns us of this. You, you, you look at places like 1 John 2 where, where John warns the church that there would be those who would come out and, and the Lord was actually bringing them out to reveal that they were wolves and not sheep. But he, John tells us there to not be suspicious, not look around at your brothers and sisters with suspicion, assuming everyone's a traitor, but to make sure, to look at yourself and to make sure you are established in Christ. To make sure you are established in the truth. To make sure that you are not a hypocrite. Thus you must forsake evil. Establish yourself in Christ. And kiss the Son with true awe, true honor, truly loving Him. And friend, if you're living in hypocrisy, then take this warning and turn. You say, well, I'm not a hypocrite. But, but are you harboring sin? Are you excusing sin? Are you thinking, you know, this is just one, it's not a big deal. I love Jesus, but I'm just going to keep on, I'm going to hold on to this sin, I'm going to hold on to this, I'm going to continue to act in this way. But I love Jesus. Don't deceive yourself. Don't be a fool. You're warned by the example of Judas, one who also once professed love for Christ, but whose sin grew and grew and grew, and his heart was hardened until he betrayed his own Savior. Take the warning of Owen. Be killing sin, or sin will be killing you. Fear God. Turn to Christ. Forsake your sin. Repent of it. Consider Judas. But Jesus was, be, was arrested by an army and with a kiss. And he was arrested without a fight. See that? In verse 46 to 49... And they laid their hands on him and took him. And 
One of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. First of all, the, the soldiers obeyed. They did what they were commanded to do. And imagine these the hands of sinners, these wicked men, laying their hands on the Son of Man, on the sinless Lamb of God, on the one, on the, the perfect, glorious Savior, and grabbing him like he was a common criminal to take him away. And the disciples reacted to this. One of them, and we're told by John it was Peter, took his sword and, and lunged at, at a servant of the high priest and, and was going and tried to attack him. All he ended up doing, the man ducking out of the way, ends up cutting off his ear. Peter thought the response to all of what was going on was to, to take the sword and to respond with violence. Jesus didn't resist, but Peter sure was. Peter, not realizing, not fully understanding that the kingdom of God is not to be established by violence. Jesus said, Jesus would say to Pilate in the following day when he was on trial, that he said, my kingdom is not of this world. For if my kingdom was of this world, then my, then my people would fight for me. Using the world's ways. But my kingdom's not of this world. Peter didn't, Peter didn't understand that. Peter didn't get that. He was willing to die there in that moment, perhaps. It seemed with the bravado as he, as he, as he took a lunge at, at this servant. But he was unwilling to go to the cross for Jesus. Matthew Henry says, it is easier to fight for Christ than to die for him. But Christ's good soldiers overcome, not by taking other people's lives, but by lay, laying down their own. Peter needed to come to understand this. See, this isn't about self-defense. These verses don't speak to our right to self-defense or any of those things. It doesn't address that. What it addresses is the fact that the kingdom of God will not be established by violence. The kingdom of God is not to be established by the sword. Peter didn't understand how the kingdom of God was going to be established by Jesus Christ laying down his own life for the sheep. Interestingly, uh, well, the other gospel writers give us, tell us something of, of, of Jesus' rebuke of his disciples, of Peter, for, his, for the way he reacted. Mark doesn't do that. Mark skips over that and moves instead right away to the words that Jesus has for the army that's come. And I believe Mark's setting up a, a contrast between Peter's reaction to the army, and Jesus' reaction to the army, showing how Peter, Peter reacted but shouldn't have, and how Jesus did react appropriately. And Jesus reacts and responds to the army with these words of biting rhetoric, that, or, 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 sorry, biting words of, uh, of verse 48, a rhetorical question he asks them. Jesus answered and said to them, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? Have you really? Have I ever proclaimed and preached violence? Have you, you come out as if I've, I'm a violent man. You come out as if I'm one who's been promoting violence. I'm an insurrectionist. Speaking of a robber, it could refer to a, a highway robber, someone who would attack others to steal their money. But it also could refer to an insurrectionist, to one who was stirring up trouble, seeking to have a violent, to violently overthrow authority. He's saying, am I? Is that who I am? You have to come out with me to me with clubs and swords and, and all these things to, to try to take me down? I was in the temple. He's thinking specifically of the previous the, the week past, that he was in the temple openly proclaiming the, what, his, what he believed, openly proclaiming the gospel, openly even engaging with the religious leaders in there and, 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 and refuting their attempts to, to, to cause them to stumble and fall. He was an open book and never promoted violence, they, and they could have seized him there if they thought they had a good case against him, if they thought he had done something worthy of being arrested and seized. He comes and he speaks to their conscience, and he says, Are you, are you coming to arrest me like this? This says more about you than it does about me. It talks about how, uh, it, it speaks to your own raging, even though I've committed no sin, I've done no crime, and you have no reason to arrest me. He preached to their conscience and called out their violence against him, seeking to prick their conscience for the sin they were committing. Jesus willingly went, arrested by an army with a kiss, but without a fight. Finally, he was arrested according to Scripture. He says at the end of verse 49, 
but the scriptures must be fulfilled. See, Jesus didn't resist, though he could have. In fact, if he had resisted, they would have had no, there was no way they could have arrested Jesus. But the only way they could arrest him was because he willingly went with them. That's because of his last comment. Jesus was going to do the will of the Father, as it had been prophesied of in all the scriptures. Now, Jesus here wasn't speaking of a specific prophecy. He wasn't speaking of one particular prophecy, but of every prophecy. The fact that Judas was betraying him, the fact that they were coming to take him, the fact that all his, his, his friends would abandon him, that, that, that the, the shepherd would be struck and the sheep would be scattered, that he would go to the cross. All of that had been prophesied. The scriptures must be fulfilled. The Father's plan of salvation must be fulfilled. His being arrested was not a, was not a, 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 a problem with the plan. It was the plan. His arrest was no accident. Perhaps his disciples should have been listening carefully. This is what Jesus, this is what had been prophesied. Jesus was going as it had been prophesied and as he had even told them and taught them. But they weren't listening. Those who were arresting him should have listened. They were being used of God and though they were responsible for their sin and though they were acting in wickedness, yet they were, yet they should have listened and focused and paid attention and realized what they were doing. He, the, the one, the very one they were arrested, was going willingly to the cross. He was the very Savior they needed. He was the very one they needed to save them from their sins. Do you see, brothers and sisters, what Jesus Christ did willingly for you and me? The Scriptures might be fulfilled. But each one given by the Father to the Son would be saved. Because Jesus Christ went willingly, according to the Scriptures, to the cross. Arrested by Jesus and abandoned by the rest, your Lord willingly approached the cross all alone. We've seen Jesus arrest the hands of Judas and this army. We've seen his willing submission that the scriptures might be fulfilled. And next, secondly, we're going to see his abandonment and his willing approach to the cross, even as he went all alone. In verse 50, in seven words, we have a very sad statement. Then they all forsook him and fled. Then, after seeing the scene that was unfolding before them, this army coming, led by Judas, and Jesus not resisting, Jesus who had the power but didn't use it to defend himself, after they saw all that was going on, the disciples gave up, they fled, they ran away, they abandoned him, they forsook him. They scattered into the, into the Mount of Olives to get away, think, not wanting to be arrested with him, not wanting to go down the path that he was willingly going down. They went attempting to save their own lives. And as they went, they were fulfilling the very words of verse 27 that Jesus had said, when Jesus had said to them on their way to Gethsemane, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. And they all protested, led by Peter. We will not abandon you. We will not forsake you. No, 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 Lord, you've got it all wrong. And only a few hours later, they all forsook him and fled. They all forsook him and fled. Not a single one remained with him. As Jesus had spent his time in prayer to the Father, they had opportunity to watch and pray lest they enter into temptation, but they wasted their opportunity. They were so full of self-confidence. They were so full of, of, of belief in themselves. They had no need to believe in God. And they were completely unprepared. Completely unprepared. You and I, brothers and sisters, must learn from this, from this as well. You and I must prepare ourselves now for the hour of temptation. When we will be tempted to deny Christ, tempted to forsake Christ, tempted to try to save our lives instead of being willing to lose our lives for Christ. Tempted to believe that to save our lives in this world is worth, is worth it. Put your hope in Christ now, not in yourself. Be trusting in Christ now, not in yourself for when you face temptations. And seek by the grace of God to, to, have, to have the victory over little temptations over little temptations to deny Christ, over, over those, those, those times when you're feeling ashamed to be a Christian, when you don't want to open your mouth and speak to someone about Christ. Build up your strength by the grace of God through, the, through, through now, in these times when we don't really face persecution. What 
areas in your life require you to deny yourself and to take up your cross and to follow Christ now. Jesus said we are to do this daily. What does that look like in your life now? Where are you trying to put the cross down and to not deny yourself? Take up your cross. Even if the cross is not that heavy right now. But learn to carry the cross by the grace of God so that when real persecution comes, you will be able and able to stand in the power of Christ and to persevere, to not run away and abandon Him and forsake Him. How will you be able to give up your life for Christ if you're not even able to give up a little bit of your reputation in your neighborhood for Christ? How could I think that I would be able to give up my life if I'm not willing to give any dates to deny myself at all now? Learn from these disciples. They all abandoned Jesus and fled. But Jesus stood. Jesus stayed. Jesus didn't get away. He didn't try to get away. He stood alone and stayed, going to the cross alone to save the very ones who ran away from him. Standing there, willingly going to the cross to save those who were unwilling to stand with him. We see the disciples abandoning him. But then we see in verses 51 and 52 this story. How a certain young man, now a certain young man followed him, having a linen cloth thrown around his naked body. And the young men laid hold of him, and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. It's a bit of a mysterious story. There's a mysterious character here. We're not told who it is. We're not really told even why, uh, outside the context, we're not really told why. Why the story is included? Only Mark includes this story. The other gospel writers don't have it, and and it, there's been it's a source of much speculation as about why it's in here. First, speculation about who it is. There are some who would argue this is a this is Mark. This is a picture of Mark, who, whose mother did live in Jerusalem at the time. There's a picture, a self-portrait, as it were, of Mark, who was there at the scene, or. And, and was, was painting himself into the picture, as many, uh, many famous artists have done in their paintings, painting their face in a, in a, in a place in a picture. And this was Mark, as it were, painting a self-portrait in his gospel. There are those who, just, who, who say it was just an unknown person who happened to make a great impression on Peter, who was relating the story to Mark. That it was just a, 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 an unknown person, but it was, he was there, and, and this story was there, and it was vivid to Peter. Others would say it was a disciple, although it seems very clear that, it seems to me that, that, that there's a distinction between this man and the disciples who had already fled and run away. But, but the fact of the matter is, as much as, personally, I, I would like to think it was Mark in a self-portrait of Mark. Uh, and, and, of course, uh, you know, inspired by the Holy Spirit. But, but the, the fact of the matter is, we don't really know who it is. We're not told who it is, and we don't know. And the other question is, where did he come from? He was wearing only this thin cloth, this thin linen cloth. It, was, uh, it could have been a, a, a shirt of some kind, or it could have just been a bed sheet. This is the type of material you make a bed sheet out of. And, and perhaps he was someone who was sleeping and was disturbed by the commotion. Wherever he lived, he was disturbed by the commotion of the soldiers and the army and of the group. And so he got out of bed and only threw on this, had this bed sheet around him, and he he went to see what was going on, and he, he went to see what was happening, and he saw Jesus get arrested, and he began to follow a bit, and to see what was going to happen. Perhaps a follower of Jesus, we don't know. Perhaps a follower of Jesus spiritually, say he was literally following Jesus and see what was going on. And, and as he's following, some of the soldiers in the army saw him and tried to grab him. They, they, they didn't see, seek to know who he was, but they just thought he must be someone, and so they violently tried to grab him. He was able to fight and, and slip away, and he left the, the bed sheet or the, 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 uh, the cloth in their, in their arms, and he ran away, stark naked, ran, running as fast as he could to get away from this army, to get away from Jesus and the situation with Jesus. Now, without a context, this is a very odd story. But what does it have to do with anything? Why would Mark write this? Why would the Holy Spirit inspire these words? Well, I think there, there are two helpful explanations. First, there are those who would say this was to primarily to show the violence of the army. Show just a kind of this mob that they didn't care who they were grabbing. They were grabbing anybody that seemed associated, and they were just this violent group. And these were the types that had grabbed Jesus 
the hands of sinners and taken the sinless Son of God. Perhaps that's part of the reason. But I think more of it, I think it has more to do with emphasizing the absolute abandonment of Jesus Christ. That I think this is an emphatic statement of abandonment of Jesus. And I agree with those who would, who would make this argument. Think of this. This young man was running away, stark naked. Shame! Shameful! This was, this was shameful. It would be shameful today. It was shameful then to run away in this way, to be found in this way. And yet he would rather run away shame in this absolutely shameful way than to be arrested with Jesus, than to stand with Jesus. Running away naked was preferable to standing with Jesus. We read in Amos 2, uh, verse 16, where, where God is speaking of the judgment he was going to bring against Israel, and how even there the most courageous of men would run away naked. This was, a, this was a, to emphasize just how shameful they would be, just how, how full of shame and fear and, and cowardice they would be, that they, the most courageous of the men, would run away naked. This is a picture, a picture, I think, that helps us understand this picture. It wasn't a prophecy of what's going on here, but it's a picture of shame and nakedness. But yet, this young man decided that was preferable than to standing with Jesus. And this unnamed young man, who we don't know who it is, is it stands as a picture, a representative picture, of all the disciples who had run away from Jesus. Ashamed of Jesus Christ. And it's a picture of all the followers of Jesus, of you and me, who have ever been ashamed of Jesus Christ and have denied him. And it emphasizes how completely isolated Jesus was. All alone, isolated, but yet willing to go to the cross. Showing how willing he was to go, even though he had been abandoned, even though he stood all alone, yet alone. He faced the cross and was willing to go to the cross for those very ones who ran away from him. Arrested by Judas and abandoned by the rest, your Lord willingly approached the cross all alone. We've considered the completion of Jesus' betrayal in his time in Gethsemane. He was arrested without a fight, led by, by an army led by Judas. We've seen the disciples abandon Jesus, all of this fulfilling prophecy, what was going to happen. For me, there's only one left in the righteous way, living in the obedient way, living obediently before the Father, and that was Jesus Christ himself. What we have in this story, brothers and sisters, is the story of utter human failure. Everyone but Jesus failing to live right before God. And yet that failure provides the backdrop to the stunning submission of Jesus Christ, the God-man, to the way of the Father, to the will of the Father, to the way of the cross. Every single one of those uh, other, uh, every single one in this story needed Jesus. Every single one needed the Savior. Judas, who knew so much but had rejected him, needed that Savior. The army, who perhaps had very little idea of who Jesus was, was still acting sinfully and wickedly and needed that Savior. The religious leaders who knew, who knew, the, saw the fulfillment of prophecy but rejected and denied it and rejected Christ, they needed that Savior. And the disciples needed the Savior. Although they were believers, although they, they, they believed on Jesus, and yet their confidence, they, they needed to understand their confidence needed to be in Christ, not in themselves. And it demonstrated that their salvation had nothing to do with them, it had everything to do with Christ. That they needed that Savior. They could not stand on their own. Only one stood alone. It was Jesus Christ. The only one who could be the Savior. He was hated, he was abused, he was misunderstood. And yet he was resolved to complete the work the Father had given him to do, and to be the Savior for sinners. And he was the only one who was fit to rescue his people from Satan's bondage, to turn away the wrath of God against sin, to redeem his people. He was the sinless Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. 
And though all failed him, yet he would fail none of them. And that all who trust in Jesus Christ would never be forsaken by him. Even those who run away from him like his disciples. Christ willingly, all alone, went to the cross. And it's at the cross that he would face the ultimate abandonment. The abandonment of his own father. As he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As the wrath of God was poured out on him for the, for the sins of his people. Forsaken of God, so his people wouldn't be. Are you believing in Jesus Christ this morning? He calls you. Even the worst of sinners, he calls. As we see, as, as we see his work even here, he's, even in this passage, he's calling out his sin, the sinners for their sin, pricking their consciences. He prayed for them when he went to the cross. In fact, as we read in the book of Acts, many of them were saved. In Acts 2, where Peter, God uses Peter to prick their consciences, and he says, you are the ones who crucified Jesus. And they said, what shall we do to be saved? And God saved 3,000 of them. And then in Acts 6, where we're told that even many of the priests believed and were saved, those religious leaders that were against Jesus. Christ's work is sufficient for you. Do you believe on Jesus? Brothers and sisters, this reminds us that you and I are to take no credit for our salvation. By nature, we were enemies of Christ. By nature, you and I were those who would have been in that army, taking down the Savior. But He saved us by grace. And He sustains us and keeps us by grace. And even when you and I fail Him, as we do so many times, as the disciples did that night, Yet He keeps, stays with us. He holds on to us. He never forsakes or abandons us. Rejoice that the one who knew such abandonment will never abandon you. Even if everyone else abandons you, He never will. And He knows what it is to be abandoned. And when you feel alone and you feel abandoned, He will always be with you. And then like Athanasius, resolve to stand for Christ. Resolve to stand for Him, even if the whole world be against you. And don't trust in yourself for that strength. Trust alone in Him and stand firm in Him. Brothers and sisters, what a Savior we have. The one who stood all alone. Praise Him for the great work of salvation that He worked for you. Praise Him that He went to that cross all alone. Dear Lord, dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for your great work of salvation that you completed perfectly for us, going all alone to the cross to bear the wrath of God against us, or against yourself for us, for our sin. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you never abandoned us, even though we've abandoned you. You, know, you will never forsake us, though we have forsaken you. Forgive us for our sin. Keep us from abandoning you. Keep us strong and firm and true, standing for you, even if the whole world be against us. And, and may we find ourselves trusting in you, now and for always. If there are any hearing this message who do not know Christ, O oh Lord, show them that you are the Savior of sinners, even the worst of sinners, and save their souls. If there are any who are living hypocritical lives, those who are in hypocrisy, professing outwardly to love Jesus, but inwardly dwelling with sin and loving sin and holding on to sin, oh Lord, please, give them the grace to kill sin before sin kills them. Hear us, we pray, and remember us for mercy. Jesus' name. Amen. Receive now the blessing of your God and go in peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.